The Patriotism of Palestinianism, Daniel Greenfield's column for Wednesday, May 30th, 2012. Daniel Greenfield's columns in general can be found at sultankanish.blogspot.com. This is being read by Adam Taxon. The Patriotism of Palestinianism. Each century brings forth its own patriots. Once upon a time we had Patrick Henry. Now we have Senator Patrick Leahy, who declared in the Senate that his opposition to an amendment that would distinguish how much of the UNRWA's funding goes to actual refugees versus fake refugees was a patriotic act. I always look at what is in the United States' interests first and foremost, and this would hurt the United States' interests, Senator Leahy uh, stated firmly. It is, of course, difficult to find as compelling a national interest as the UNRWA, a refugee agency created exclusively for the benefit of 5 million Arabs, approximately 30,000 of whom are actual refugees, but all of whom hate the United States. Senator Leahy, who could not discover a national interest in the, ba in the balanced budget amendment, drilling for oil in Anwar, or detaining Muslim terrorists, all of which he voted against, finally discovered a binding national interest 5,500 miles away in Jordan, where, quote, refugee camps like Baqa, population of 80,000, which are virtually indistinguishable from local towns and cities, complete with block after block of residential homes, stores and markets, multi-story office buildings, schools, hospitals, and assorted infrastructure, must not be looked at too closely. As a city which will soon celebrate its 50-year anniversary, Baqa is older than many modern Israeli cities and is as much a refugee camp as any of them. The only difference between Baqa and Ariel is that no one, is in, no one in Baqa does anything for themselves because they are all eternal refugees with an entire UN agency decided, dedicated to wiping their bottoms for them. A unique and singular honor in a world full of authentic refugees who have been driven out by rape squads and genocide without getting their own minders in blue. Senator Mark Kirk's heretical proposal to begin reforming the UNRWA by distinguishing between people who could have some claim on being refugees from the vast majority who cannot met with Le Leahy's declaration that, frankly, Mr. Chairman, as a member of this committee, I always look at what is in the United States' interest first and foremost, and this would hurt the United States' interests. Samuel Johnson said that patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel, but even Johnson would have, been, would have had trouble understanding how a refusal to count who American aid money is going to is in the nation's best interests. It is no doubt in the best interests of the denizens of Baqa and their Jordanian rulers who need to spend that much less money taking care of their people. Um, but ignorance certainly doesn't do the United States and its interests any good. A refusal to seriously examine the books does, however, benefit the UNRWA and politicians like Leahy who continue to support this boondoggle. Jordan, the location of Baqa and many other aid sinkholes like it, has a population notoriously hostile to, to the United States. After September 11th, Al-Qaeda enjoyed some of its highest approval ratings there, and most Jordanians still not, do not believe that Muslims carried out the attacks. Despite half a century of aid, 67% of Jordanians blame the West for their lack of prosperity, and majorities there support suicide bombings against civilians and American soldiers. Clearly, if there is one place that there is a compelling national interest to plow aid money into without doing the math, it's Jordan and its refugee camps, which somehow manage to be even more hateful than the general population. Supposing that everything that Israel's opponents say about it is true, where exactly is the compelling national interest in standing behind the UNRWA's $1.23 billion biennial budget? And not just the budget, but a refusal to reform the methodology for accounting where all that money is going to. Before Washington, D.C. cuts another quarter of a billion dollar check to one of the biggest wastes of money in an organization that excels at wasting money, even more than D.C. does, it's entirely sensible to ask whom the money is going to and how long we will be making out these checks. There are currently 5 million people living off the UNRWA dole. Sooner or later, there will be 50 million. Jordan's government has done everything possible to inflate the UNRWA welfare rules and keep cities like Baqa and their people the responsibility of Western nations. One day, the Jordan government, the British-appointed monarchy ruling over the original Palestinian state, may decide to give up the farce and put all their people on the UNRWA rolls as refugees. And we'll have to keep on paying without asking any questions. After all, it is in our national interest. 
Thomas R. Nides, the Deputy Secretary of State, took a position against the amendment, calling the number of refugees a, quote, final status issue, end quote, that can only be resolved when Israel and the PLO militias complete their negotiations at some unknown date. Diplomats have developed a bad habit of insisting on a dysfunctional status quo tilted toward the Muslim side until the Messiah of final status finally comes. There can be no Jewish housing in Jerusalem because it's a final status issue. We can't count the refugees because it's a final status issue. And we can't question the final status because that too is a final status issue. After 20 years of negotiations that have led to nothing except the rump terrorist state that is one big baka inside Israel, it's ridiculously clear that there will never be any final status negotiations, if only because the PLO militias don't actually want the job of taking care of their own people. Even if they did, in less than a decade, the PLO thugs in suits, subsidized, armed, and trained by the West, will be consumed by Hamas. And Hamas, despite whimsical statements from Peter Beinart to the contrary, has no intention of entering into final status negotiations. Final status, for all intents and purposes, means forever. It's an excuse for maintaining Baka and the United Nations budget, and nothing else. But suppose that we might one day look forward to final status negotiations. There is no reason why an objective quality like what makes one a refugee cannot be addressed by the nation funding the refugees. Final status agreements cannot defer the dictionary or common sense. And unless we are expected to keep on funding Baka on its 100th anniversary or its 200th anniversary, sooner or later the numbers have to be added up, and people whose only claim to the bottomless aid bucket is that their great-grandfather was on the losing side of a war of conquest started by their side will have to get jobs. According to Senator Leahy, raising such issues is not in America's national interest, but apparently it is in America's national interest to keep on funding the UNRWA which employs terrorists and acts as a welfare state for some of the most anti-American people in the world. But Palestinianism as patriotism is not an original formulation. When times get tough and policies get senseless, backing the terrorist militias is described as a national interest for the United States. But is it really? What conceivable national interest has there ever been in picking up Soviet leftovers like the PLO and pouring billions of dollars into a sewer, which only spits up more terrorism, agitation, and chaos? When senators and deputy secretaries talk about national interests, what they really mean is the interest of Muslim monarchies in the Gulf, who bring up Israel and the plight of its terrorists every time an American diplomat or general drops by Riyadh, Doha, or Kuwait, Kuwait City. The UNRWA, Baka, and the PLO aren't an American interest. They're a Muslim interest. What Leahy and Nider really mean is that it's in America's national interest to cater to Muslim interests. Nider comes closest to saying that when he writes that cutting UNRWA aid would place a heavy burden on our allies in the region, who despite their billions in oil wealth and their passionate feelings on the subject, somehow can't be bothered to cover the cost of feeding, teaching, and caring for Baka. The King of Jordan found $1.5 billion to build the Red Sea Astrarium, a local version of Disneyland. But the Hashemite monarchy, like the House of Saud, the al the House of Sabah, and every other bunch of Bernoulli's tyrants with palaces and investments across the world, can't be asked to care for their own people in their 50-year-old refugee camps, who are kept that way because it's an easy way to sock the global West for another few billion dollars to fund their terrorist training bases. Even if there were a valid reason for the United States to champion Muslim interests by carving up Israel in order to create yet another Sunni Muslim state, it would not be a national interest. It would be appeasement. Palestine is as much in America's national interest as the Sudetenland was in Britain's national interest. A foreign policy of feeding other people to, do to the beast, in the hopes that he won't feed on us, is not a national interest. It's craven cowardice that has no hope of succeeding. Is it really in America's national interest to turn over its foreign policy to the Muslim monarchies who birthed al-Qaeda and conduct a covert war against the West? Is it in our interest to keep funding terrorist training camps like Baka without asking any questions? And are politicians like Senator Leahy who treat questioning the UN bureaucracy that has empowered terrorists while draining budgets as an unpatriotic act, the real patriots or are they the pawn of pawns of tyrants who have one hand on their shoulder and the other on the knife in their back? After World War I, King Faisal conspired with British officers to proclaim himself the ruler of United Syria, a territory that was to include Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, and parts of Turkey. Faisal couldn't keep his kingdom, and the Hashemites eventually lost everything else, including Saudi Arabia and Iraq. All they have left is Jordan, a 
country whose population is indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the Arab Muslims on the Israeli side of the border, and a crown secured by American aid and the fiction that a country where 70% of the population sees themselves as Muslims rather than Jordanians has a future. The only difference between the Hashemites and the houses of Saud, Sabah, and Thani is oil. America ships money and soldiers to the Gulf, and the Gulf monarchs ship back terrorists, oil, and mosques. That's the formula that got us into two, into two Gulf Wars, one war on terror and a clash of civilizations. And men like Senator Leahy insist that we shouldn't scrutinize the disastrous policies of, that the Arab League, the cat's paw of the Gulfies, has pawned off on us, and that doing so is somehow unpatriotic. Gulfism in all its forms, whether it's Syrianism, Palestinianism, or the jack-of-all-trades, Islamism is not patriotism. The future of the United States will not be secured by turning Washington, D.C. into the front office for a bunch of medieval tyrannies that have no future. The House of Saud and all the other houses don't enjoy popular support, have parade guard militaries, and nothing on their side but money and foreign support. The only thing they have to offer us is more bakas in Jordan, in Israel, in Lebanon, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and all across Europe and the United States. And once that's done, they'll tell us that it's in our national interest to foot the bill. The end.